Welcome to the 7 Habits of Highly Effective People with Dr. Stephen R. Covey. In this audio program, Stephen shows that effectiveness with ourselves and with others is based upon our individual character and not upon quick-fix formulas or manipulative techniques. He also teaches that we are not solely the product of our conditions, our upbringing, or our genetic makeup, but that the essential elements in long-term effectiveness, our habits, can be learned and deeply internalized. Stephen begins by identifying specific examples of results you can expect from living and applying the seven habits and shares how to get the most out of this program. The seven habits are habits of effectiveness. Stephen next relates Aesop's fable of the goose and the golden egg to illustrate how consistent effectiveness is always achieved through a balance of the results we seek and the assets that produce these results. Now let's define what we mean by effectiveness. We've just defined basic habits. What do we mean by effectiveness? It's a most interesting term. I'd like to give a very simple definition. I call it the PPC balance. The PPC balance. P stands for production of desired results. PC stands for production capability. To quickly illustrate, you'd like to have a clean house. You'd like your children's rooms to be clean, wouldn't you? That's the desired results. That's P, production of desired results. PC means that your child is committed to keep that room clean, cheerfully, without being reminded, bugged, supervised, conjoled, manipulated, threatened, beat up, carrot and stick. That's PC. Now you can get a clean room by doing it yourself. Well, what's happened to PC? What's happened to the asset, the person, the resource to clean the room? What's happened to that person's motivation, desire, habit patterns, skill, knowledge, and attitude combined into a habit? That's PC. That's production capability. So I suggest effectiveness is to get the clean room and to have the kind of relationship atmosphere in the home where people want to do their own jobs on their own cheerfully. I'm sure all of us have studied Aesop sometime in our life, have heard his fables. The one that I like using in teaching the PPC balance is the one about this very poor farmer who's really down on his luck, down in his spirit, and totally impoverished. He comes across his favorite goose, and to the sight of it is a brilliant, glistening gold egg. He's thrilled, but then he realizes instantly Someone's tricked me. It's bogus, so he throws it into the bushes. Then on second thought, he says, well, what have I got to lose? And he tests it. He finds out it's pure gold. He can't believe this. This windfall fortune. The next day, he finds another one and tests it. Again, pure gold. The next day, the same thing. On and on. Every day he goes back. Soon he becomes so fabulously wealthy, he becomes also impatient. He didn't want to go back every day. He wants them all and he wants them now. Out of his greediness, he lops off the head of that goose, reaches inside to get them all, only to find none. In all organizations, there's basically three resources or three assets. The physical, the financial, and the human. That's obviously true in a business, but it's also true in a family. How many here have ever had the experience of neglecting an appliance and found that it only lasted one season? Like a lawnmower. How many have neglected the car? Proper maintenance, proper feeding and caring for the goose, if you see what I mean, and found that the golden eggs started to go down. In fact, think about this. You're in business. You've been in charge of this machine. There's tremendous growth taking place in the business and a lot of upward mobility. You'd like to get promotions too, so you want to make a tremendous record, short-term record. You don't care about the long term. What would you do? Run as hard and fast as you could. Right. Run it hard and fast as you could. No PC, right? No feeding the goose. No taking care of the goose because you just want to just crank out those products. And you do. And you make a terrific showing. Your production goes higher and higher. Your costs are low because there's no maintenance. You have really moved from red ink to black ink. You've moved into profitability. So we promote you to the upper executive ranks so we can get access to your skill and talent and thinking. The next new person comes on board. By this time, because of a lack of PC, because of a lack of feeding and tending the goose, the machine begins to break down. This floor person looks inside and notices, calls for downtime, costs go up, production goes down, profits shot back into red ink. Now, what do people say to you, the first supervisor of the machine, 
in the executive corridors the next day about your successor. What do they say? He's a loser. I have never seen such a clear case of how leadership can make a difference. As soon as you left, it went down. What if I were a coach and I really wanted to produce an outstanding team? Short run. I'd give all my energies to my present players. No recruiting. And I put on a fantastic show. And I am lauded and applauded all over the place. And I leave. The next coach comes in in the legacy that I had just left. No one knows that. All they know is we've moved into constant losses. You can apply this thinking to any field of endeavor you wish. For instance, take your finances. Have you ever confused interest and principle? Have you ever invaded the principle in order to live better? Used it as income? Start to eat away at the goose in order to live higher on the hog? To have the things you want? Is that effective? Eventually, the goose dies. There's no more golden eggs. Or take your marriage. Do you and I make constant deposits into that relationship? The most important relationship probably we will have in life, along with our children. Sometimes I call this the emotional bank account. The emotional bank account is like a financial bank account into which you make deposits and you can take withdrawals. And if you make many deposits into that relationship, the trust level goes higher and higher, and the nature of the communication becomes very soft and gentle and instantaneous. How many have such a high emotional bank account with someone, you can communicate with them almost without words? How many can even make mistakes in your communication, and they'll correct for the mistakes and get the meaning? It happens. We all have that kind of relationship with people. It doesn't take time to communicate. It takes time to build the emotional bank account, to build the trust level. When the trust level is high, when the emotional bank account is high, Communication is easy, it's effortless, it's instantaneous, and it's effective. If the trust level is low, it makes no difference how eloquent we may be, how clear we may be, how skilled we are in communication technique. People will be reading between the lines. It's like walking into a minefield. You never know when one of those things might be hit and go off. The essence of relationships is the trust level, the emotional bank account. That's PC on relationships. That's the goose. The quality of the relationship in business, the quality of the relationship with the customer. How does the customer perceive your business, perceive your products and your services? Is there a high degree of trust toward the integrity of your advertising, of your claims? Do you come through again and again and again to where there's an extremely high emotional bank account and the customer almost pulls through the channels, the products, you don't have to push it all, to a position where we could call customer insistence. In this very community, I remember many years ago, a restaurant that served a fantastic clam chowder. You could hardly get near the place in the middle of the day because people would line up to get the clam chowder and would even take some home for the evening. They'd reheat it. Great business. No one knew what was happening, but that business was sold. New owners came in in an effort to improve the profitability, in an effort to get more golden eggs. They watered down the clam chowder. What do you think happened to profits for a month or two? Of course, they zoomed, they went up. Why? Because you cut cost. And market insistence, market preference was still there. But little by little, the goose was getting sick. People's expectations were not being met. And the emotional bank account started to go down because of these withdrawals until a position was reached where the place was almost emptied out. They tried to recover, but by that time, they had violated the integrity perception of their customers. No one knew what had happened inside, but everyone knew what had happened to them. So also in a business, we can be on people's backs to treat the customer well, but how do we treat that person? The key is to always treat the employee exactly as we would want them to treat our best customer. What if that were the paradigm? You treat a customer like a volunteer because that's what a customer is. You treat an employee, an associate, like a volunteer because they have to volunteer their best thinking, their best loyalty, enthusiasm. You can buy a person's back, but not their mind. You can buy a person's hand, but not their heart. That kind of dedication, commitment, and loyalty must be earned by taking care of the goose, rather than taking the short view of constantly letting the bottom line of the number of golden eggs govern all decisions, all behavior. You see how anti-quick fix this is? You see how long-term thinking this approach is? This is the essence of effectiveness. I'll tell you a very fast way to tell whether a business has a good PPC balance. How do they deal with customer problems? 
If the customer's problem is out of standard operating procedure and it kind of throws the business and you get an answer like, I'm sorry, sir, that's our policy, you'll know it's out of whack. What is a problem? A production problem, a P problem, is a PC opportunity. If you want to start making big deposits into customers, treat their problems as being important and try to solve them. It's a PC opportunity and out of it will come many future golden eggs. You'd like people of different departments to cease this contention, this wrangling, this interdepartmental rivalry and to cooperate with each other, to understand each other's concern and paradigm and to learn to creatively cooperate. Now, you might take a strong hand and go for the desired result, threaten, change some compensation system to get some desired result. But the basic spirit of those people has not changed. The PC, the production capability, has not been altered. It requires your constant attention to it. How do you create a culture inside that organization that values both the desired result and the preservation and enhancement of the assets that produce it, the people, the resources? How do you do that? You see, so many organizations are filled with interdepartmental rivalries. In fact, one of the shocking experiences I've had in my consulting and training work over the years is to realize a high percentage of the problems begin with the people at the very top. The nature of the relationship they have with each other often, if deteriorated, gets translated throughout the entire organization. Like osmosis, it's diffused everywhere. Dag Hammarskjöld, the late Secretary General of the United Nations, made this brilliant statement. It is more noble to give yourself completely to one individual than to labor diligently for the salvation of the masses. You see, a person could be very actively involved with many people, many worthy projects out there, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, five, six, seven days a week, and not have a meaningful relationship with his own spouse, with his own business partner, with this teenage son who's going through terrific turmoil. And it will take more nobility of character in the form of humility, courage, empathy, respect, understanding, to do whatever's necessary to rebuild that one relationship. But the ironic thing is, it is in the rebuilding of the one that the power to deal with the many comes from. The key to the 99 is always the one because everybody is a one. For instance, if you should see me, say, punishing somebody in a social way that you felt was totally unjustified, how do you know I won't do that to you? You're a one. The key to your family is that one child that tests your patience the most. That communicates eloquently the unconditional or the conditional character of your love. What if we could say to our loved ones, my love for you is greater than anything you do that bugs me, and live it on a one-to-one -one basis? I have a habit of taking my kids on dates, and we plan these dates. We find that the anticipation of the date is as satisfying as the realization. So we think about it for a long period of time. I came to one of my daughters and said, Honey, tonight's your night. What is your choice? What would you like to do? Well, Dad, that's okay. No, really, what would you like to do? Well, what I want to do, you really don't want to do. Well, really, honey, I, I want to do it. No matter what it is, it's yours. No, no, I know you don't. I know you don't want to do it. I want to go to Star Wars, and I know how much you don't like Star Wars. You slept during Star Wars. You don't like these fantasy-type movies. I know you don't. So that's okay, Dad. No, honey, if that's what you'd like to do, I'd like to. Uh, Dad, you're just trying to do your daddy thing. Don't worry about it. We don't always have to have this date. By the way, Dad, do you know why you don't like Star Wars? Because you don't understand the philosophy and training of a Jedi Knight. <laughs> I said, what? What was that? You know the stuff you teach, Dad? That's the same things that go into the training of a Jedi Knight. Let's go to Star Wars. And we did. And she sat next to me and gave me the paradigm. And I became her student, her learner. We went to all three. It's totally fascinating. I could begin to see out of a new paradigm the whole way that a Jedi Knight's basic philosophy and training is manifested in different circumstances. That was not just a P experience, it was a PC experience. It was bonding in our relationship and very satisfying in its fruit. We got golden eggs and also the quality of the relationship, the goose, was significantly fed. Stephen continues his discussion of effectiveness by describing how we can improve the quality of our relationships by making constant deposits into the emotional bank account of others. Let me briefly mention six ways of building the emotional bank account with people, all people, spouses, children, employees, customers, whoever. First, 
simple kindnesses, simple courtesies, if you will. Thank you. I appreciate that. How are you today? Some people can treat strangers at the door better than their own loved ones. They fake it a lot. Their private lives often are in shambles, and they act out their frustrations into the lives of their loved ones. And they are constantly taking small withdrawals. They're discourteous, unkind, insensitive, without understanding, sympathy. The opposite of this, of course, would be a withdrawal. Second, honesty, to just be an honest person. Third, the making and keeping of promises. Probably there's no more massive withdrawal than to give a person a promise that's important to them and not come through. Because the next time you make a promise, they won't believe it. Fourth, expectations. The managing of expectations. You will find the root cause of almost all relationship difficulties, breakdowns, come from conflicting expectations surrounding roles and goals. Think of what I just said. That almost all, I've even heard some people claim all, Broken relationships come from conflicting role and goal expectations. You said you, I never said that. No, no, my, my agreement was, oh no, no, I heard you. I heard you very clearly. You, I never said that. What I said was, you said your role was, no, oh, that's not my role, that's your role. I was waiting on your, oh no, you told me to just do what you told me to do. I expected you to think on your own. We've got to accommodate this customer. Your role is to take some, <laughs> last time I took initiative, I got shot out of the saddle. That's not my role. You say you want creativity and innovation, but I find you reward lockstep and conformity. Fifth, loyalty. Loyalty. Watch this. Let's say that the two of us are talking about him, our supervisor, in a bad-mouthing way. What do you know I'm doing when you and I have a falling out? Same thing. That's right, same thing. Because you know my nature. If you want to retain those who are present, be loyal to those who are absent. Because what do they know you're going to be like when other people are bad-mouthing them to you behind your back? It's far greater to be trusted and respected than it is to be liked. So you're taking the long view. Your integrity, which means you operate on the same principle toward the totality of your relationships, is intact. That builds the emotional bank account in powerful ways. Even though at the time when you badmouth somebody with someone else, it may seem to kind of cement your relationship. To use the construction expression, it's bad cement, it's bad mud. All it will take is a storm on that relationship and that internal flaw will surface. It doesn't build the relationship, it hurts. Far better to say when someone's bad-mouthing somebody else. I think you have a good point. Let's go and talk to that person. Let's go and make an effective presentation to that person to help that person. They know you would do the same thing to them if someone was bad-mouthing them to you. But a lot of people aren't ready for that confrontation. It's so much easier to sit and bad mouth, to complain, to murmur and moan. It's easy. Seems to, you know, make you feel better. You get validation from someone, they massage your heart. Remember this, it's greater to be trusted, greater to be respected than to be liked. That's PC activity. Interestingly, it's also P activity. It produces golden eggs almost instantly. If it doesn't instantly, it will eventually. That's the true essence of happiness, is the willingness to subordinate what we want now for what we want eventually. So sometimes it takes a little self-denial and sacrifice of what we want right now, that golden egg right now, in order to make the deposit into the emotional bank account and build it up so that we can have what we want eventually. The preservation of the asset, the enhancement of the asset, the people that will continue to produce the golden eggs. Sixth, if you blow any of the above five, Learn to say, I'm sorry, I apologize. And we all do blow them from time to time. But the one thing that people will not forget or forgive is a cover-up. Even presidents can be deposed through cover-ups. The anatomy of cover-up usually is pride and leads to defensiveness, self-protection, self-justification, accusation of other people, and the whole relationship deteriorates. You've often seen it even in marriages from one of spontaneity and richness, softness, to one of accommodation, to one of toleration, into various forms of hostility that may break out in hot wars in a legal court or cold wars in the four walls of your own home, which ooze out into the emotional atmosphere, the ecology of the home, a powerful osmosis kind of teaching to the next generation where they learn that the way to solve problems is to fight, 
to take each other on or to flight, to withdraw, to give up, to capitulate. Dominant Dan, Dorothy, Dormat may seem to have a harmonious marriage, but remember that unexpressed feelings never die. They're buried alive and come forth later in uglier ways. The emotional bank account's overdrawn. And with the key relationships of our lives, the emotional bank accounts will evaporate if we don't constantly make deposits into them. They require constant nurturance, constant feeding, constant tending to keep them rich and filled with joy and happiness and kindness and the spirit of forgiveness and humanity and softness and gentleness. The opposite of all of those six things, of course, are withdrawals. Now, I must say at this juncture that sometimes we can get too focused on the PC and neglect the golden eggs, too focused only on, say, education and neglect the industry that produces the golden eggs, the money that supports the education. Some people run for three, four hours a day bragging about the 10 extra years of life it gives them, unaware they're spending them running. <laughs> we can get imbalanced in the other direction. Or sometimes you can get the wrong kind of PC, as is found, I believe, in many quick-fix training programs in organizations. doesn't work. You know, I remember a while back I was teaching and someone came up and we were kind of just musing, looking outside, and he said, frankly, Stephen, I don't enjoy these seminars very well. Really, what's the problem? He said, well, I get grilled at night on the phone by my wife. Unbelievably grilled. I, he, she wants to know everywhere I've been, everything that I'm doing, with whom. All right, what'd you do this morning? And then, uh, what about your lunch? Who'd you have lunch with? And then the afternoon? And then the evening? What did you do then? What kind of entertainment? You know, asking all these questions. Almost asking, whom can I call to verify all this? Look at this beautiful scene out here. Look at how much these people are enjoying themselves. He said, of course, she knows all the right questions to ask because I met her when I was on one of these trips and married to someone else. <laughs> and I asked, you're kind of into quick fix, aren't you? He said, what do you mean? You'd like to have your wife's head rewired instantly, right? Well, I don't know about that, Stephen, but the thing is, I, I just feel like it's not a good attitude to have. I mean, it just makes my life kind of miserable. I said, my friend, you can never talk yourself out of problems you behaved yourself into. If you have a hundred thousand overdrawn emotional bank account, you have to make many deposits for a long period of time to get into the plus figures. There is no quick fix in relationships. There must be high integrity and consistency behind your values and your habits, that they're congruent with each other. Then eventually, if you make the six kinds of deposits I've been speaking about, a whole new level of confidence will come into the relationship. And the fruits of that are unbelievably marvelous. To maintain the PPC balance, the balance between the golden egg, the thing we want, and the health and welfare of the goose, production capability is a difficult judgment call. It's elusive, but I suggest it is the very essence of effectiveness. It balances short-term with long-term. It balances going for the grade and paying the price to get an education. It balances the desire to have that room clean and the building of the relationship so that the child is internally committed to do it, cheerfully, willingly, without external supervision. It balances getting cooperation between those warring departments and producing the fruits of that cooperation with the cultivating of a culture or an atmosphere that causes the two departments to empathize with each other, to understand each other's concerns and problems, and to create new solutions that are better solutions than either department originally proposed. That is called synergy, the sixth habit, which we will go into later. That, in a sense, is the summum bonum of all else we're trying to do. If you can get that kind of thing, a high level of cooperation, a high level of teamwork, an extremely productive culture on a roll with real momentum, based on correct principles over a long period of time, you know you've got the basic principles and habits of effectiveness interwoven in the total fabric of that situation.